What's up everybody and thank you for joining me for another video. My name is Wack4863, but you can call me Wack. In this video, I'm going to go through the patch notes for the Age of War Chapter 4. Now this is currently on the public beta client and you can download that if you own the game on Steam and check it out for yourself. Now, this morning I had the opportunity to co-stream and give live reactions to the dev stream and everything that they showed in that stream about the Age of War Chapter 4. I'll link that in the description of this video if you want want to hear my live commentary while they're streaming. Let's jump right into the patch notes. I'm going to skip over the known issues. If you are playing the public beta client, you should get over, read these patch notes so you know what to expect and if you see these issues in game. Otherwise, let's jump into what's coming with the Age of War Chapter 4, scheduled for release on April 2nd, 2024. The Sacred Hunt event is coming to the Isle of Sipta and the Exiled Lands, so you are not missing out on this in the Isle of Sipta, and there's more juicy information later on in these patch notes for the Isle of Sipta. But let's jump right into the Sacred Hunt event. First of all, players are ambushed at night by followers of Jebelsog. Now, from my testing, it seemed this only happened once per night, and in my case, it was only one enemy that would be in the ambush. These ambushing enemies will drop a map that will lead you to the new event hub. However, that event hub is marked by a pillar of light that shoots up into the sky, so you do not need that map, and it's kind of a redundancy in my opinion. The hub has a vendor and a quest NPC to interact with, as well as a crafting table, the Altar of Jebelsag, to craft Grand Champion Lures. You can purchase Champion Lures at the vendor NPC using the Gnarled Fangs dropped from the Ambush NPCs. Using the champion lures at a small number of locations around the map, the exact locations are hinted to by the NPCs, however I will have a guide showing you exactly where those are, but those are going to summon a champion to defeat. Champions, including the final boss, take minimal damage unless the player is naked and wearing the war paint purchased from the hub vendor. Now I can already see a lineup of videos and people challenging themselves to beat these bosses without having those requirements. You do much less damage and I believe you take more damage if you're actually wearing armor. So it's going to be a pretty difficult task to get done as these enemies have an enormous amount of hit points. But maybe in the future I'll try that out myself once chapter 4 hits and see if we can do a live stream where we go and try to defeat those champions while wearing armor. You will then use the materials acquired from champions found on the map to craft the grand champion lure at the hub altar of Jebel Sag. After speaking to the bloody tongue of Jebel Sag NPC, and a spoiler alert, that NPC will teach you how to craft the grand champion lure. Purchase and drink the potion of the hunt from the vendor to teleport to the boss arena. Use the Grand Champion Boss Lure to summon the brand new Werebear Final Boss. So that's the big content addition for Chapter 4, the Sacred Hunt event. Many of you may be wondering how this is related to the Age of War. There is a tie-in. Most of that information is going to be in the Battle Pass tableaus explaining how this all fits together with the previous chapters. Fatalities have hit the Exiled Lands in the Isle of Sipta. There is a chance for enemy humanoids to go into a dazed state upon a death strike. Now, one of the questions that I got asked when I was live streaming is if you can get them into that dazed state and then knock them out. The answer is no, that's not possible. Once they're in that dazed state, it's only a matter of time before they fall to the ground dead. If you want to engage in a fatality, you simply have to hit them again after letting any animations that we're playing finish. So if you're doing a combo on an enemy and you see them hit that day's state, you need to stop the combo, stop the animations, wait for a second, and then swing your weapon again to get the fatality to pop up. Performing a fatality adds a buff that stacks. Now the fatality buff gives you instant health back, it also gives you faster regeneration of stamina, and it boosts the damage that you're doing with the agility and strength based weapons. 
And I will make a guide that shows all of the different fatalities with the different weapons in the future. And I'll go into greater detail about those actual buffs and how much percent you're gaining per different stat. Let's jump into the follower overhaul and there's a lot of really good things going on with this overhaul. First of all, the control over your follower behavior has been removed from the follower radial and replaced with a new menu in the followers inventory panel. The nice thing about this is that you can can look and see how your follower is set up and if you like the way that they're set up you can then duplicate that onto another follower and if you don't like the way it's set up you know how it's set so that you can make those minor adjustments and changes to that follower without having to remember how you set them. The follower command radial has been reworked for ease of input. Essentially, you no longer have to click the item. You just select that item and as you release that button, it's going to initiate that command. There is a new flee command. This command will instruct followers to run from combat and regroup with you. This is not to be confused with the return command as that command is now somewhere else. So the flee command makes them stop combat and come back to you. There's a new wait slash defend here. This command will instruct your followers to stand in the indicated location until instructed otherwise. Aggressive and defensive followers will fight and defend the location while passive and pacifist followers such as mounts will avoid combat while staying near the location. Attack and return commands have been reworked to be more reliable when the follower is already in combat. The stop command has been removed. The stop command really hasn't been removed as much as it's just been reworked to the wait slash defend here command. I told you earlier there was some new juicy stuff going on in SIPTA. There are now destructible camps in SIPTA. There are small camps that are destructible at Social as well as in New Luxor. Enemies do not respawn until the base is reset. So unlike the interaction that we have on the Isle of Sipta, when you go to Almoraha and you are fighting those guys and they're respawning all over you, these enemies are not going to respawn until those bases are completely reset. And the base reset occurs on a timer if no one is nearby, as well as after the boss is defeated and all players leave the vicinity. New purge encounters and I know some of you may have seen my speculation video about some of the things that I came across in the admin panel and the dev kit about different enemies that could come in the purge. The purge has changed so much that your standard basis for how you build your base in chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three is going to change in chapter four. I ran quite a few purges during my testing and I'm really excited to say that they do not feel stagnant like they did prior to this update. So we now have new NPCs coming in the purge. One is the thieves and yes, they can be invisible. One is champions and they're actually going to have an entourage that comes with them. So they, they lead like a splinter cell group to your base. We also have golems and yes, they do have all the debuffs that you would expect from golems. And we have the star caller as well, who is going to rain down star metal on your base. Now I couldn't get the star caller to spawn during my testing when I was live streaming so I don't know how much damage this is going to do to the base but believe me when I say I think it's a really cool function and I'm definitely going to be testing it a lot more as we get closer to this chapter's release. These encounters are aimed at high difficulty purges and offer the purge new ways to counter your defenses. Good luck. If you've been around my channel for a long time, you know that I'm a big fan of the purge and I was a little bit let down with what we saw in chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three of the age of war. But I can tell you my excitement for the purge has been renewed coming into chapter four because it doesn't feel like you can set up your base in a way to lead them through a maze that just kills everything. The purge is actually not going Going to just target your entrances any longer. There's a new siege weapon that's being introduced, the Ballista. This looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. I didn't get a whole lot of chance to test it, but 
I think this thing is really cool. It's going to be much easier to aim than the trebuchet is, but it also has its downsides. So we'll get in, we'll do some more testing with that, but I think having a different type of siege weapon is a lot of fun. During the live stream, they also talked about the different types of ammunition for this thing. There are both bolts and balls. The bolts are excellent against living targets and have a particular effectiveness against avatars. Balls are good for point-based siege damage. And I've seen some talk about how much damage these ballistas do to avatars. I think it's probably going to be balanced over the next few patches or the next few updates. But I feel like the ballista right now may be more powerful than it actually needs to be against the avatars. There is a huge rework to inventory management and crafting and the buttons and, and all sorts of things. The entire UI, at least on that inventory and crafting screen, has been changed. Some of the UIs in other areas have been changed as well. It's all really good looking, and honestly, I like the direction that they're taking with this. There are a lot of really good features, like being able to auto-deposit any items that are in a chest already directly from your inventory with the click of one button. And I think this is a really good move for the future of Conan Exiles. There are some odd things that have changed where you're just gonna have to get used to them once you get your hands on it. So instead of right clicking something to use it in your inventory, instead you're going to have to press F to use it. And that can be a little bit awkward when you first get your hands on it. But after a little bit of time, you're just gonna get used to those new button presses. And I think it's gonna feel a lot better. One big change that came with this is the quick split where when you right click or right bumper, you now have a selected amount of items that unstack. So basically splitting the stack in half, there is no longer a way to precisely split a stack. So if you were shift clicking and dragging to a different inventory or a different slot in your inventory, you would have then had a slider to say split this stack from one. 100 to 10 and you'd end up with 90 in one stack and 10 in another that has been removed but there's already been a lot of feedback about wanting that feature to remain in game so we'll just have to see how fun calm approaches that in the future but as of right now it is just a quick split that splits it in half there are some changes to how you're going to dye your armor. It's no longer done in your player inventory. You now have to do that on the dyer's bench. Now, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about this change. At the end of the day, does it really matter? Probably not. But I know early on, sometimes you just come across dye and you could just apply that to your armor. That's not the case anymore. You are going to have to build the dyer's bench, place each item in there individually, and dye each item separately. So it's a bit more of a cumbersome process. I understand why they did it, and we'll get into that here in a moment, but it is quite a big change to the way that you're going to interact with dyeing your armor. The reason for that change really comes into play where they talk about the way the buttons are laid out in your inventory. Instead of the buttons changing and becoming something different, depending on what you have selected, all the buttons now have a consistent spot where they are either going to be selectable or they're not going to be selectable. So you're no longer going to see those buttons at the bottom of your inventory change and have different options there. You're going to see that all those buttons show up in the same place every single time when that button is active for whatever item you have selected. There are some new keybinds that are in effect. I'm just going to list those on the screen right now so that you can take a look at them, but you are going to need to get used to using these new keybinds once you get the Age of War Chapter 4. So now we're in the bug fix section and I'm just going to highlight a few things in here that make a big difference to the game. And if you want to read everything else, the link is in the description of this video. The first one that I want to highlight is fixed an issue which allowed characters to use tools on nodes that were intended to be picked up by hand. 
The exception for this is that sickles can still be used on bushes. Now this means that you can no longer use your hatchet to hit sticks that are on the ground and get more sticks. This also means that the lotuses will no longer be harvestable with a pick. You are going to have to pick those by hand or use a sickle. The Scorpion Queen boss now has a 100% drop rate for the Scorpion Egg Sack. So for those of you that wanted a Scorpion pet and maybe you were trying to get one, it's much easier in Chapter 4. If you end up dying in the Karak dungeon, you can now summon your corpse with the Circle of Power. That interaction is no longer blocked. The Sword of Krom is back in the patch notes once again, hopefully for its final time, who knows, we'll see if it crops back up again in the future, but it can now be used by thralls and the player. And additionally, in this version of the game, the test version, you can swing it a bunch. It's no longer draining all of your stamina, which is interesting. I don't know if that's going to remain that way or if they're planning on changing it again. However, I can and tell you that its health damage and its armor penetration has been reduced from what it was before. It's now just slightly better than the Blade of the Adventurer, but at least it's usable by yourself and by your thrall. The one thing that I think they could still change is to raise the durability because it currently only has 450 durability. Whereas the Blade of the Adventurer, which only has a little bit less damage and armor pen, has 2800 durability. So, probably not the last time we'll see the Sword of Krom in the patch notes, but at least it looks like it's no longer a piece of junk and it's usable again. The next topic that I want to cover is combat. These things were not mentioned in the patch notes, but they were brought up during the dev livestream. First and foremost, in your settings under gameplay, there's a new option to rotate the camera when you attack to face the way that your HUD dot is pointing. This reverts the change that happened in the Age of War Chapter 3 to being more like the combat style that we saw in the Age of War Chapter 2. Additionally, there's been a change to the stamina regeneration. It now can take up to a second for your stamina to start regenerating. Lastly, there's been a rework to rolling thrust. This perk no longer has any effect on your stamina. The only benefit from this perk is that you get additional armor penetration. All in all, I have to say that out of all of the chapters that we've seen for the Age of War, I'm most excited to see this one come to the live version of the game, and I think you guys are going to have an absolute ton of fun engaging in the content that's coming. Don't forget to whack the like button on your way out, and let me know in the comment section below what are you most excited about from what I covered in this video. I'd like to thank all my YouTube members for their continued support. Y'all are absolute legends. If you want to know more about becoming a YouTube member, click the join button below this video. Memberships start as low as $1.99.